pollution, poverty, disease. There are so many unmet needs in our world. There's so much work to be done. Yet right now, millions of people are standing in unemployment lines. In Spain, youth unemployment is over 50%. Globally, in the next 10 years, there will be over a billion young people coming into the workforce and only 300 million jobs between them. How is it that with so much need in the world, so many people are complaining they can't get a job? Could it be that the systems for how we exchange our things and our time have broken down? Could it be that our mechanism of exchange, our money system, is restricting us from working together for mutual gain? I'm speaking here today because we need to rebuild finance to achieve a fair, sustainable and prosperous world. In the next 18 minutes, I'll show you how the current monetary system massively undermines our ability to work on common problems, whether through government, business or the voluntary sector. I'll explain how we, that's you and I, are going to have to rebuild finance ourselves. That means not waiting for experts, bankers or politicians to rebuild it for us, but getting on with it ourselves. I'll explain how we can use community currencies that get people back to work, back to making and trading, and how by doing that we can glimpse a future more abundant than we might have previously imagined. The mainstream debate on financial crises ignores an underlying cause that course also underlies our crises with sovereign debt, environmental destruction, spiralling inequality and mass unemployment. That cause is our monetary system, a system where banks create money out of nothing for profit. In most countries, about 3% of our money originates from government-owned mints that make notes and coins. But the rest is digital. It's created by banks out of nothing when they issue loans. So when you or your government goes to a bank to take out a loan, the bank doesn't lend its own money or that of its depositors. Instead, it creates that money by an electronic accounting entry. Sound impossible? Well, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to the central bankers themselves. When banks make loans, they create additional deposits for those that have borrowed the money. Banks extend credit by simply increasing the borrowing customer's current account that is, banks extend credit by creating money. So the central bankers that looked at the issue have stated that private banks do create money. But is the bank's ability to do this restricted in some way, perhaps by reserve requirements or capital ratios? Apparently not. Changes in reserves are unrelated to changes in lending. The textbook treatment of money can be rejected. Banks taking first their credit decisions and then looking for the necessary funding and reserves of central bank money. If you're feeling a bit dumb for not knowing this stuff about money, then don't worry, you're in very good company. Even some Nobel Prize winning economists have been shown to not understand the extent of how money is created as debt by private banks. As economics professor Steve Keane says, economics is too important to leave to economists. Some of the jargon they use, like broad money, inside money, M1, T-bills and the like, can make us feel that this subject is beyond us. But just as we couldn't leave our governance to the divine right of kings or the Bible to Latin scholars, we can't leave our economies to a profession that's been failing us so badly. This debt-based money system drives a range of economic, social and environmental problems. One key problem is that as banks create the amount borrowed, but not the interest to be paid on that loan, it means there's more debt in the world than money. Although individually we might pay off our debts, collectively we're in debt forever and paying interest to the banks forever. So this money system makes increasing inequality a mathematical certainty. No wonder then, 2% of the world's population right now controls about half the world's wealth. Another problem is that over time we need an increasing amount of lending to service existing debts, which means the economy must grow and grow. The world is not expanding and many resources like oil are already peaking. So some Nobel laureates and politicians have noted the inappropriateness of GDP growth as a goal for our societies. Yet with an interest charging system of money creation, we have no choice but to grow. Otherwise, there'll be less new debt issued to service existing debts 
and there will be defaults, foreclosures, bankruptcies, unemployment, and unfortunately, history shows us, then crime, extremism, and even war. And what if those banks, with the privilege of creating money out of nothing, lose confidence in our ability to pay, or our government's ability to pay? If they lend less, then the whole economy has less money. That means less money for investment, wages, jobs, which means we stop doing stuff for each other. That's why people are idle while there's so much that needs doing. My grandmother is in a care home in the UK. After budget cuts and redundancies, she gets less attention than before, as the carers are busier due to less staff. Meanwhile, somewhere, a professional carer now sits at home unemployed, drawing benefits. Same needs, same people, same building, same skills, same community. So what's changed? The situation hasn't changed. It's just that our means of exchange, our currency, has been taken away from us. Greece has suffered the greatest contraction in money supply during the recent crisis. Less money means less jobs, and it hurts to become unemployed. The suicide rate in Greece increased by 25% last year. In a protest against the cuts, one pensioner, Dimitris Christoulas, killed himself in front of Parliament. In his suicide note, he wrote that his pension from 35 years of work had been so reduced that he saw no alternative. I quote, no other solution than this dignified end to my life, so I don't find myself fishing through garbage cans for my sustenance. You don't need to be religious or left-wing or right-wing to see that for some of us to have this unique privilege to create money out of nothing for profit and reduce our purchasing power as a result is just plain wrong. Today, the mainstream debate on financial crises flirts with ring-fencing deposits or reducing leverage regulating predatory lending, speculative derivatives, or imposing a charge on financial transactions. But all these debates are secondary to the primary issue of how money is created by private institutions as debt, with interest, for their own profit. Once we have this knowledge of how our money is created and what it means for our lives, we can be confused about what it means for our careers. Yet there are now increasing opportunities to become involved in real efforts to rebuild our monetary systems. To rebuild finance, we need major monetary reform and entirely new forms of currency. Let me explain both. In recent years, the campaigns for monetary reform have picked up pace. In the UK, the campaign Positive Money is raising public awareness of the problems with this debt money system and is working with politicians to propose legislation for restoring the ability of the government to issue money rather than private banks. It's critically important to get involved in such efforts within your countries and internationally. Yet I believe we can't wait for politicians we need to create our own solutions now. So they say necessity is the mother of invention. Well, a few months ago, an alternative currency was introduced in the Greek port city of Volos. Their central market doesn't require euros. From jewellery to food, electrical parts to clothes, everything is on sale through a local alternative currency called the TEM. If you have goods or services to offer, you gain credit, with one euro notionally equivalent to one TEM. You can then use your TEM earnings to buy whatever else is being offered through the network. The whole system is organized online with members holding TEM accounts. It's a form of mutual credit where everyone can issue or earn credit without the need for a loan from a bank. Everyone can exchange as much as they wish without it being restricted by the availability of euros. And everyone ends up returning to zero so no one makes money out of issuing the currency or charging interest on it. The mayor of Volos supports the project and thinks it can coexist with the euro. This Greek initiative is one of thousands worldwide. Already tens of thousands of people are trading in currencies that their own communities run, from slums in Rio and Nairobi to enterprise hubs in Brussels and Bristol. You could search online for Ithaca Hours or Time Banks in the US, Let's in the UK or Chimgaur in Germany to get a sense of all these new currencies. In Brixton in the UK, you can even go into the pub and pay for a pint with the Brixton Pound using the SMS on your mobile phone. As I said, necessity is the mother of invention. The oldest and largest mutual credit system in the world is the Veer in Switzerland. Each Veer is equivalent to one Swiss franc, 
but can't be exchanged for them. The Veers existed since 1934 and today has over 70,000 business members that trade over 2 billion a year in the currency. 80% of those participants are small firms that have found it important for keeping their business going during downturns. That's when banks restrict new credit, especially to small businesses, and so these firms increase their use of the VIA at such times to buy inventory from other participating firms. Independent research has found that the VIA has helped the Swiss economy suffer less severe economic cycles as its neighbours. I volunteer for a Swiss NGO called Community Forge. Now over 50 community currencies in France, Belgium, Switzerland and now Bali use our free and open source software. Taking community currencies online in this way means that they can scale. The 50 communities using our platform are now even able to trade amongst each other using our new inter-trading system. We are deploying mutual credit systems because they have a number of advantages as a means of exchange. It means underused assets can be matched with unmet needs to the degree that people want not to the degree that there is money around to complete a transaction. As all credits and debits ultimately cancel each other out, you don't find increasing amounts of money chasing the same amount of stuff or services, so the currency doesn't inflate. There is no interest charged upon the issuing of credit, so wealth isn't extracted from those with lower incomes. And as most mutual credit currencies are locally focused, they encourage us to trade locally so reducing our carbon footprint and promoting local regeneration. At a time of increasing scarcity of natural resources, this more efficient exchange and use of existing resources is more needed than ever. Mutual credit is not the only currency option in our digital age. The VEN is a digital currency that represents a basket of commodities, other currencies and also carbon credits. Last year it was the first digital currency to be added to Thomson Reuters which makes it possible for financial institutions to trade in it. Another one is Bitcoin, an entirely unbacked digital currency that's become famous for making some of its adopters very rich. The emergence of these digital currencies means we need to better understand what kind of money systems could enhance, not harm, our communities. That is where we need some brilliant and ethical minds we're not naive, and there's a lot to learn about good currency design and management. For instance, in Argentina, community currencies really did help people during their financial collapse. But some of the issuing groups then managed them really badly and crashed the value of their currencies. So there is a lot still to learn. If you get involved in these solutions, something amazing can happen you may begin to get a sense that the scarcity we experience in life, where we struggle to make ends meet, is partly artificial. That the scarcity and struggle is not from a lack of wealth in our environment or our communities, but from this defective mechanism of exchanging things of value, a defective money system. We then realise that a new currency system could unlock our hidden wealth. The source of our wealth is not a job and its wages, but one person or company providing value to another. Money, if designed for our needs, should simply be our mechanism for measuring value and exchanging things of real value. So we can design currencies that are always in sufficient supply to help match underused assets with unmet needs, to avoid a carer sitting at home while someone needs care, to avoid a building sitting unused while people are homeless, to avoid a garden becoming overgrown and unproductive while people sit idly at home eating crap food. The key realisation is that we can design and use currencies that connect communities to their own abundance. Our current money is a social technology based on an outmoded design that is about to undergo revolutionary change, which is going to determine the future well-being of our society. And we can all play a part in that change. Here are some ways. First, learn more about the monetary system and educate others about it. Challenge the oversight and misinformation on this topic wherever you find it. Once more people understand money, the more likely it is we'll all demand and participate in alternatives. It's why I did this video and why I run executive education on innovations in sustainable currency systems. Second, 
join campaigns for national and global monetary reform so that governments and communities can issue their own currencies, not private banks. You could also ask your local government to allow people to pay some of their taxes in community currencies, and that would provide substantial backing for them. Third, start participating in community currencies and business barter networks yourselves and see how you can help them improve their function and scale. We need more people learning by doing and helping improve the variety of systems out there. Fourth, if there are no community currencies in your local or professional area, then explore whether to set one up. Find an economy, whether local or professional, and seek partners to create a mutual credit system, and then get in touch with us. Fifth, if your organisation does community-related work, such as a development or environment charity, say Oxfam or WWF, get colleagues to look at how to incorporate monetary reform and currency alternatives into their strategy, as well as some specific projects. We need to see much more research, education, experimentation and capacity building on these issues. Sixth, inform your colleagues at work about community currencies and business barter systems and encourage your organisation to participate. You could even ask if some of your wages could be paid in a community currency. The mechanism of money is the single most important way that decisions are made in our society and most of us don't know the first thing about it. I've often asked people the simple question, where does money come from? Politicians, bankers, heads of NGOs, in nearly every case they don't know. And when they think they do, well, they're generally wrong. So I think it's time to crowdsource some comedy on this, to make a movie of people's response to the question, where does money come from? So if you have a good camera and microphone, then please get out there, ask politicians, bankers, professors, celebrities, whoever, the simple question, where does money come from? If they offer an, an explanation that's nonsense, then great, we could use the footage. And if they did, then you could follow the question with something like, did you know that 95% of money is made out of nothing more than the borrower's promise to pay it back? If they say they know that, then you could ask them, well, why do you think that's good for us? Once you've done that, upload your clips on YouTube or Vimeo by the end of 2012 and tag them Money Magic. Then tweet the link with that tag, Money Magic, and send the link to the nice and serious people who made this video for us at www.niceandserious.com. Are you guys okay with that? <laughs>